Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to our special guest services, the first of uh, four in the month of November. You're very welcome if you uh, received an invitation through your door or a personal invitation from a friend. It's just great to see you, and we really appreciate you coming out uh, tonight. There is coffee served after the service, uh, and if you want to, to wait behind and enjoy a cup of coffee, that's, that's great. There are uh, some booklets on a table at the back, and all of that's free. If you're interested and want to find out more, maybe you want to pick up a, a, a booklet and take it with you. The program is very simple. We're going to try and confine ourselves to an hour from half six to half seven. Um, we're going to sing a song right at the beginning. Uh, there will be a brief prayer. We're going to watch uh, a video that comes from the Christianity Explored group of videos, uh, and then we're going to do an interview with David here at the front, and then Josh is going to finish off with a short uh, epilogue. So, so we'll uh, stand and sing our opening song uh, together. <laughs> Thank you. 
Let's all come before the Lord in prayer. Let's all pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You for what we have just been singing about, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we thank You that He did come into our world and that He did die upon the cross so that we could be forgiven and brought into relationship with Yourself. And as we explore that tonight, we pray, O oh God, that You would just give us understanding, that You would give us clear minds that we might understand what this good news is all about, and that You would speak into all our hearts, and that You would draw us out after Yourself. So, we look to You, and we pray, O oh God, that You would speak to us all this evening for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, I'm going to invite David up, uh, and we'll have a little uh, interview with him. It's a nervous thing, isn't it, when you need a drink of water? David, um, first of all, just tell us uh, who you are. Tell us where you're from. Uh, tell us a wee bit uh, just about your family, and tell us what you do for a job. All in a sentence. David McCarthy, elder here in Ballymena Baptist Church, been attending here since 1987, 86, 87. Um, I live just outside of Brasheen. I have three of a family, three children, married to Wilma, and I have two grandchildren. Um, I work for a company, Alexander Dennis, who build buses for a living, um, and I'm contract manager for Ireland. Okay. Uh, David, um I suppose you were brought up in a Christian home, and you were sort of brainwashed into believing this stuff, and uh, you never ever questioned it. Is that right? No, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. Um, my parents weren't Christians, but where we lived, um, we lived right beside my grandparents, and both of them were Christians. So the Christian influence, the, uh, I don't know how you say this, I was going to say the good side of influence came from my parents' side. We were always taught to do what was right, do what was good, but beyond that, the Christian influence came from my grandparents. Okay, and you see, when I was <coughs> um, young growing up, I remember a man coming up to me and saying, are you saved? And I hadn't a clue what that meant. Uh, I didn't understand that term at all. Um, so tell me what that means. To be saved. How long have you got? Um, I think to get a proper understanding of what it means to be saved, you have to go right back to the beginning. You referred this morning to creation. In creation, when everything was created, when God created everything, and I'm going to just say one thing before I say anything more. Everything I'm going to say tonight is rooted, I hope, in Scripture, because that's the basis of what I believe and where it all comes from. So this isn't something I've made up in my mind or a feeling I have. I believe this is what's taught in Scripture. Um, so. God created the world, and as he created every day, it says it was good, it was good, it was good, until it gets to the very end, where he says it was very good. And part of that creation was the creation of man. However, in Adam and Eve that he created and put in the garden, Adam and Eve had, as has been said on the video there, they, they had a heart problem, because in their heart they wanted to be equal with God. So therefore Satan took them into sinning against God and doing something God had forbidden. From that point, sin entered into the world, and from that point, God's plan of salvation came into place. Well, David, just to pick you up on that, so what has the sin of Adam and Eve got to do with you? Surely they're responsible for their own sin. Why, why, what has that got to do with you? We are all responsible for our own sin, but it was through Adam and Eve that sin entered into the world, and from that point, all of us were born, as the Scripture describes, as sinners with a, a problem and the fact that God was a holy God. We were sinful people. Uh, as a holy God, God couldn't look upon sin, um, but he wanted into a relationship with us. So there was nothing we could do to fix that relationship. So he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to this earth uh, to pay the price, uh, to pay the penalty for my sin and for our sin, um, so that we could come back into a proper relationship with God. So really, to to be saved means to be in a rest. proper relationship, yeah. to be reconciled. You said it this morning. It was the word you used this morning, reconciled okay. with God. So, David, what age were you when you were saved? 
My first profession was made when I was 13. 13, so... I think. Hold on, to count that up. Yeah, 13. So, David, you know, you weren't running with loose women. You weren't... <laughs> I was in third year at school, Steve, and there was many a thing going on. You weren't an alcoholic. Um, what had you to be, like, you know, surely at 13, there wasn't that much that you were guilty of. There's probably a whole lot. I was guilty of, and I'm not telling you, because as Rico Tice said, I would hate it all to be published in the wall somewhere. Um, I think from my background, I, I struggled up to that point. Sunday for myself and my brother was quite simple. From our own family's point of view, with my mum and dad, we were sent to Presbyterian Sunday School in the morning, then Presbyterian Church after that. Uh, my mother turned up reasonably regularly, but we were forced to do both. Uh, Sunday afternoon was Gospel Hall Sunday School, and then Sunday evening was Gospel Hall meeting, and there was always people talking about this, that, and everything else since then. In my background, I had a family who taught me to do what was right, do what was good, so therefore, was I bad enough to be called a sinner? Probably no. From a Gospel Hall point of view, when you went to missions and when you went to meetings, there was these people who were asked to testify. And mostly the people who testified were people who had a problem. Had a, well, probably in those days there wasn't as much of a drug addiction, but they had an alcohol addiction. They, had, uh, they were on their third marriage. There was this, that, or something else wrong with them in life. So as far as I was concerned, I didn't fit that mold either. So therefore... All of this Christianity thing really hadn't a lot to do with me. So you were thinking at that time, because you were hearing these extraordinary testimonies of people who were really, their lives were in an absolute mess, and they were changed and saved and converted all at one stage, that, that you weren't really that bad. It wasn't that bad, and on the other side of life I was doing what was good, um, as far as I was concerned. Um, I wasn't really doing anything wrong. Yes, I get into the old scuffle now and again, um, through school, through life, and all the rest of it. But there was nothing I seen outstanding in my life that was blatantly bad. And, and what changed your thinking in that, where you realized that you had something to be saved from, rescued from? Um, can I describe it as having lied my way into heaven? I think it's a good way to put it. Um, it came in the fact that Gospel Hall Sunday School, uh, it didn't break for the summer the way we do. Gospel Hall didn't break for the summer. Um, so even although Presbyterian Church, we probably seldom attended during the summer, every Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock we were put in a car. And, pardon me, my throat's getting dry. Uh, we were put in a car and we were shipped to Brasheen Gospel Hall. Personally, I wanted a break, but the only way to get a break was in the Bible class. So the Sunday school didn't get a break, but the Bible class did. Um, so a friend and I went to our Sunday school teacher one day just at the beginning of October. Uh, I think it was the first Sunday in October, actually. And we said we wanted to go into the Bible class. Um, our Sunday school teacher asked the question, well, are you saved? And... Um, Excuse me. Don't take another drink, just. Alan answered yes, and I answered yes along with him. Uh, Alan was right in what he said, and I wasn't. So, David, just to pick you up on that, so I had a similar experience to that, too, that I lied about something that uh, I said I was a Christian and I wasn't actually a Christian. But obviously, you got a bit emotional at that point. Mm -hmm. They were telling us that, and that still smarts with you. Was that was that the sin that sort of convinced you of of? That was the sin, I think, that realised. I went home that afternoon, and okay, it wasn't the first lie I'd ever told in life, um, but it was the one that struck home. And <clears throat> somebody here might be saying, "Well, do you know that's that's really a trivial sin, like mm -hmm. lying and saying you're a Christian and you weren't." actually a Christian. Why was that sin so significant and so serious to you? Um, pro it was probably no more significant than any other sin I, I had ever committed, but it was the sin that I think where the Holy Spirit spoke into my life and says, 
no, that, that's not right. You, you've made a profession of something that's not right um, and you need to sort that out. Well, do you know <coughs> the, the way you felt back then mm -hmm. and that sin was really, I suppose, aggravated to your conscience and so on? What do you call that? You know, what, what is that? Who's doing that? What's happening? I think it's the Holy Spirit working in your life, convicting you. It's conviction. Um, I think that's why we get to a point as we're saved where we must repent of the sin that we have committed. Um, we have to, before God, uh, confess that sin and ask for forgiveness for that sin. So it's really the conviction of that sin in our life. Sometimes, I suppose, God you know, puts his finger on one particular sin, and he drives that sin home to our conscience to show how sinful that is. And that was exactly the same thing that happened to me, David. I turned to a friend, and he said, you know, you have to be a Christian before you become a missionary. And I said, sure, I am a Christian. And I felt so miserable. And that, that sin came with such force. You know, here it was I lying about things of God. So, so this... I mean, what did conviction feel like to you? I mean, were you a bit miserable? What did conviction there? feel like? Conviction was something I couldn't get it out of my head. I couldn't sleep. Um, and probably until I asked for forgiveness, sleep wasn't going to come to me. Um, I just, it wasn't for long because it was three, four, three, four o'clock in the afternoon. And it was about three o'clock in the morning when I asked like, the Lord in the middle. So... Tell us a little bit about that process. You, you said you asked the Lord into your life. Pre presumably you knew then how to deal with the sin that you'd been convicted of. So, so what, what did you actually do? What did you actually pray? Okay. How did you actually feel? I can barely remember what happened yesterday. <laughs> never knew what happened 30-something years ago, Steve. Uh, even more than that. Um, Really, it, it was as simple as I got onto my knees at the side of my bed. I, I asked the Lord. I, I could probably have spent hours rhyming off the sins in my life, but it was that one sin. I, I asked the Lord for forgiveness for that and asked him to come into my life and forgive me for what I had done. And you would say at that point then you became a Christian? At that point I became a Christian. How did you feel? I mean, did, you, did you feel any different? Was there a big zap of spiritual energy came into your life or you know what no. happened did you feel any different did, what did you do I knew there was something different how did I feel I, I, I would struggle to put my finger on how I felt I just I felt a relief in, in my life but I also felt a pull from Satan as well and that caused me problems for the next four years of my, three, three years of my life. Um, so, you know, f those teenage years are always difficult, aren't they? You know, you're, you're not sure whether you've just believed this because it's the done thing or whether it's uh, personal. So tell us a wee bit about that struggle, what was happening. The, the struggle came, I think, quite simply from the fact of the lie that had been told at the beginning. If I then went to Sunday and said I had become a Christian, what was that going to say about me? Because I had told a lie where I had said I was a Christian. Uh, and, and I think Satan used that for um, many years to hold me back from actually telling anybody I was a Christian. So what happened in my life was Sunday I was a good Christian. Uh, on Monday through to Saturday um, I was one of the boys, if you like, um, growing up through school, rugby teams, hockey teams, all the rest of it. Um, and that was a constant pull in my life. I knew enough with all I had learnt in Sunday school and everything else and having listened in Gospel Hall Sunday school that I could probably play the chameleon. I could pass myself off in any um, of the, the groups I was walking with or playing with and I could fit into any, any situation that I wanted to sit in. I could be as rough as I wanted, or I could be as angelic as I wanted. Um, there came a point where um, there was a guy in school who was held back a year, he was a Christian. There was two other guys who, they came into my life as well as Christians. I realized that how they lived and how I lived was very different. 
I think that was the, the spur again for me to say I, I, I've got to, just as you've said, I've got to make sure of this profession and I've got to put things right. And was that a, a gradual change you know, or was it a sudden thing that you, you thought to yourself, oh, I've, I've got to decide whether I'm for Christ or against him or whether I'm truly a Christian or not? Was, was this a growing thing? I think it was a gradual realization. I think it's something I'd always known for the three years, but I struggled to step back from. And then over that one year, I think there was a, a probably a real slide, if you like, of realization um, to the point where I just knew I had to make it right. So what would you say to somebody, David, that this may be here tonight and they, they would say a similar situation to yourself, you know, like as a child, you know, or a, a young teen, I, I, you know, prayed a prayer, I trusted in the Lord, and I really meant it at the time, but now I'm not sure, I'm, I'm just not sure where I stand with God, and I'm not sure if I'm really a Christian or not, and to be honest, I'm not sure if it's really important at this stage in my life, what would you say to a person like that? I think the first thing is it is important. I think the next thing is it is important that you know whether your profession is real or not. I think it is important that you make sure that your profession is real. Um, if you're struggling with it, go and find somebody. The biggest struggle I had was the fact that Satan convinced me I didn't need to tell anybody what happened. Um, what else do you say to that? I don't know. Um, I, I think if you're struggling with it, I would recommend find somebody, um, sit down with them, chat it through, let people know where you're at. If you're struggling, be honest. We all struggle. Um, why? You said it's important that you sort it out. Why, why is it important? It's important because our hope, the only hope we have is in Christ. And if Satan has fooled us into thinking we're Christians, or if we have fooled ourselves into thinking we're Christians and we're not, there will come a day where it's too late to put it right. And did that sort of sense of these are eternal issues, <clears throat> heaven and hell, I mean, did that weigh heavily upon you during those three or four years that you were? Yes. Dead? Very much so. Um, I think I was part of a CE group one night um, where we were asked to do something. And we were put in two camps, and it, it was almost a debating society. And we were asked to debate um, for the existence of God against the existence of God. And the team I was in almost won if it hadn't been for one person. And that scared me. It scared me that I was able to argue so strongly from that side. Um, and others were possibly struggling to answer against that. So you were arguing against the existence of God, were you? And were you good at arguing that? No. <laughs> but you argued it and you almost won. Well, our team almost won. I wouldn't put it down to me. All right. And, and what argument did you use? Just... I'm fascinated oh, by this. Can you remember that? I'm regretting having said that now. <laughs> um, what argument did we use? I think it was just the, the argument of all that goes on in the world and how there's still all the bad in the world and the argument of the fact that there are people who are still doing all sorts of things, but yet they're the people who get on. Well, if God is a good God and the God that you say he is, well, then why but what, why does that happen? Why does he not deal with that situation? And what answer would you give to that? <laughs> what answer would I give to that? I read something the other night in a book that I'm reading at the moment. I think it was a good answer. And it was about um, a village where it was very much a Christian village and people turned up at, on Sundays to church and everything else. There was a man in that village who was an atheist, and they were all farmers. It was a farming village. And there was one year where there was something happened in the village, and the crops of the village didn't do well except for this one man who was the atheist. And he wrote a great article into the paper 
um, saying about, you know, where was your God and all of this. I was working on Sundays when you said I shouldn't, and, and yet I'm the one who has prospered here. And, <coughs> pardon me, the author of the newsletter, um, he, he published the article, and the end, the end of it, he just put one sentence. God doesn't send us accounts in October. There's an eternal dimension. No matter how well people are doing, we shouldn't take our example from other people. We, we need to, as I said, everything I'm saying tonight is rooted in Scripture. Um, so therefore, my view is we take our, our view from Scripture, and that view is that one day the Lord will return and he'll take his own unto himself. There will be a separation. I hope not. <laughs> okay. I, I want to put you in a time capsule, and I want to take you back to meet this 13-year-old boy that you were. What would you say to him? You're a good little kid. <laughs> <laughs> Stand by the profession you made. Don't let Satan fool you. And tell others of the profession you've made. Don't be scared to. I think fear's a wonderful thing and fear's something Satan uses against us. What would you say to the boy that before he was saved, um, who's thinking this through and not sure what he should do. What would you say to that boy so he's not a Christian? You, you're not a Christian. Third thing, what would you say? I don't know, honestly don't know, Stephen. Um, what would I say to him? I think, I don't know what I would say, but I think I would want to try and make him realize that even if he lives on the clean side, of the broad road for use of a Christian experience or a Christian statement even if he's doing his best in life and no matter how good he's doing and I think it's the realisation that happened to me and, and that is for all have sinned it took me a long time to realise that I was included in that word of all I think I would try and convince him that he was part of that all so uh, we try and convince him that he had sinned and that he needed to be rescued from his sin. Even his good words are good. Thanks very much, David, for that. Uh, we ex really appreciate you opening your heart uh, uh, to us tonight. And Josh is going to come up and just uh, finish off for us. Thank you. Thanks. Well, good evening, everybody. Lovely uh, to see you all this evening and lovely to be opening uh, up uh, God's Word. It's a hard question to answer, isn't it? What is so bad about my sin? And it, it's not even just a hard question to answer, it's just a hard question, isn't it? Because it's an offensive question. One of the, the hardest things about the gospel, one of the hardest things about the good news of Jesus is that it's offensive, isn't it? Because whenever we first hear the gospel, whenever we first receive the gospel, it's bad news. And we kind of scratch our heads and we go, but I, I thought the gospel was good news. But as we've heard tonight, we cannot hear the good news until we've heard the bad news. We cannot hear the good news until we've heard the bad news. Because whenever we think about this question, what's so bad about my sin, we first have to recognize that we are sinful. We first have to recognize that there are things that we have done, that we've thought, that we've said, that we've done with our hands that displease God. And in fact, we're not God's friends. We're actually God's enemies, and we're under His judgment. And it's a hard thing, isn't it? It's maybe you know of somebody, or maybe you are somebody, or maybe you've seen somebody before get so frustrated at Christianity because who do they think they are telling me that I'm wrong? What is Christians' problem? Why do they get off telling people that they are sinners 
that they are wrong. Maybe whenever you picked up that little flyer tonight that somebody gave to you, or maybe when you heard about what we're thinking about tonight in, in church, you went, well, okay, I kind of see where they're coming from. I'm not a perfect person. You know, when I look back at my life, there's definitely things that I regret. If I was given another chance, there's definitely things that I would do differently. But you know what? I'm not a bad person. I might not be perfect, but I'm not a bad person. And I do this very clever thing. I convince myself that I'm not a bad person. I do this very clever thing, and I compare myself to people who are worse than me. It's good, isn't it? It's a good idea, isn't it? Because compared to people that are worse than me, I look so much better. I might not be a perfect person, but at least I'm not like them. I might not be a perfect person, but I haven't done what they have done. And you know what? Sometimes I find a person, and they maybe are a bit better than me, but I put that down to them just having some deep, dark secret that really they can't be all that good. I use this wonky spirit level to say that I, whilst I'm not perfect, I'm still a good person. But what would happen instead of comparing ourselves to other humans, to other sinners, to other people who get things wrong every single day, what would happen if I changed who I measured myself against? What would happen if I measured myself against God? And the bit of the Bible I want to read tonight is from Isaiah. It's chapter 6. It's verses 1 down to verse 7. And Isaiah is the author of this book. He is a vision of God, and this is what he sees. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above Him stood the seraphim, each had six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew, and one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory." And the foundations of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the sermon flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Isaiah, writing thousands of years ago, has this vision of God, a great, big, awesome God in the, the old sense, filled with awe, high and lifted up, massive, huge. His train of his robe fills the entire temple. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's a dramatic picture of how big God is. Angels are flying around Him, covering their face, covering their feet, and singing, holy, holy, holy is God. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Sinless, sinless, sinless. Holy, holy, holy is God. Isaiah has this vision, and what does he do? What does a sinful man do compared to a holy, holy God? Well, he falls down. He falls down as if he is dead. He says, I'm a dead man compared to this holy, holy, holy God. You see, when we compare ourselves to other people, to other sinners, we look quite good. But we can, when we compare ourselves to a holy, holy God, we see just how bad we are. Does anybody remember those Daz ads? It used to be a great one with EastEnders. You used to love EastEnders. It used to be a great one with Phil Mitchell in it. But in the Daza, they would take two t-shirts and they would get them really dirty. They would get loads of muck on them and make them really dirty. And they would wash one in like kind of a, an unknown brand of, of a washing powder and it would come up white. And you would look at it and go, that's a good white t-shirt. I'd be happy to wear that. But then they take the other dirty t-shirt and they wash it in Daz. And Daz is the whitest of whites. And they take the shiny Daz t-shirt and they put it beside the regular t-shirt. And that t-shirt that once looked white beside the shining Daz t-shirt now looks murky and gray 
and disgusting. We look at ourselves and we compare ourselves to our friends, to our family, and we go, I'm pretty white, aren't I? I look pretty good. But compared to the bright holiness of God, we see that actually we're not white. We're wearing great, big, mucky clothes. In fact, the Bible even says that even the best things that we do are like dirty rags compared to God's goodness and God's holiness. And when you look at Isaiah, what sins does Isaiah say he's committed? He says he's somebody who's unclean lips. When you think of we lips, what, what sins can we commit with our lips? Maybe lying, maybe gossiping, maybe spreading rumors, maybe getting angry. Not bad sins, we would say, would we? We wouldn't say we're a bad person because we tell little fibs. We wouldn't say we're a, a bad person because we gossip and we inflate the truth. But when Isaiah comes face to face with his holy God, he says, my lips, the things I have said are disgusting. I'm a dead man in sight of this God. Isaiah can see that he is under God's judgment. And tonight, if we compare ourselves to God, we would see that we're also under God's judgment. But there's hope. We've got the bad news. Here's the good news. There's hope. There's hope for Isaiah, isn't there? His lips that were dirty are made clean. A coal is taken from the altar and put on his lips. And God says to him that his, the angel says that his sins have been forgiven, that he's clean. And there's hope for us too. Now, it's not through a burning coal, but it's through that holy, holy, holy God coming down and dying for us. That holy, holy, perfect God who never sinned came down. The Lord Jesus came and He died the death of a criminal, died the death of a guilty person even though He was not guilty, all so I could be made clean and all so you could be made clean. And instead of standing before God in judgment, instead of standing before God as His enemy, whenever Jesus makes us clean, we come to God as his friends, and as his sons, and as his daughters. That question, why is my sin so serious? Why do Christians take sin so seriously? Because Christians know what Jesus had to do to save us from it. The holy, holy, holy God died a brutal death, was mocked, was humiliated, shed his blood for sinners also that I could be saved from my sin. So whenever I look at myself and I think, you know what, I'm not that bad, am I? I'm not that bad of a person. Whenever I think about the, the little sins I commit, but I look to Jesus and I see exactly what Jesus had to do to save me from the consequences of what I've done. And then I can see, compared to his holiness and compared to him dying on the cross, no sin that I commit is trivial, is silly, or should be taken lightly. God died in my place so that whenever I come face to face with God, unlike Isaiah, I don't have to fall down like a dead person, but I can stand and I can be welcomed into God's family and into His loving arms. That's why sin is so serious, and that's why you this evening should take your sin seriously. As David was saying earlier, it's really important to talk to somebody about anything in life, but even more important when it comes to spiritual things, when it comes to becoming a Christian, and tonight, if, if you're thinking about something, if you want to disagree with me, if you want to talk about something I've said, something that uh, David or Stephen have talked about tonight, something we've sang about tonight, please come and talk to me. Please come and talk to Stephen. Please come and talk to David. If you came with a Christian tonight, please talk to them. We would love to know uh, where you stand this evening with God and if there's anything that we can do to better help you think about your future. Let me just pray and I'll hand back to Stephen. 
Father, we thank You that You are holy, that You are perfect, that there is no blemish, that there is no uh, sin, that there is no deceit in You, that we trust ourselves to a good and only good God. But Father, when we look at ourselves, we see that we are dirty, we see that we need saving, and we thank You so much that Jesus came to do exactly that. We thank that Jesus came for the worst of sinners. And we pray tonight that Uh, Christians and non-Christians here this evening will just have a better view of our sin, that we would hate it, and that we would run to You for help. We pray, God, that You would help us. Whatever we think, wherever we are tonight, we pray, God, that we would clearly and firmly hear Your voice, hear You speaking to us, and we pray, Lord, that Your will would be done in our lives. Amen. Well, thanks, uh very much to those that have taken part tonight and to Josh for bringing the Word. Um, If you feel that God has been speaking to you, uh, Josh and myself and James are going to be here at the front, uh, and uh, you can come and talk to us. Uh, It's the most important thing that you can ever face, the most important question that you can ever answer. And uh, and do come and, and talk with us or talk to the person, as Josh said, that you know as a, a Christian, that maybe the person that brought you. Um, we have some of these booklets, ultimate questions. We've been thinking about these big questions, uh, and uh, these are free. You can come and ask uh, us for one, or there's some uh, available on the, the bookstall. But don't don't go away without sorting out this this uh, important issue. Sin is serious. God is offended by sin, but there is a remedy. And there is a solution, and that remedy and solution, as Josh has said, is to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ Himself. So, do do come and talk to us. Uh, We'll be happy to help. Uh, That's what we're here for. Uh, We'll be at the front, and you can come and chat. Now, we're going to stand and sing our, our closing song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. Let's stand and worship the Lord. Thank you. 
Heavenly Father, we thank You for reminding us that sin is serious, but we thank You that there is a remedy for sin to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ and through a trust and a, a faith in Him, and that we can be rescued and saved from the terrible consequences of that sin. And we pray that everybody in this room this evening might know what it is to have their sins forgiven and to be brought into a relationship with God. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for His sake. Amen. So, do uh, remember that there's a, a cup of coffee there, so uh, you can mix. Uh, and we'll be at the front here if you want to come uh, and talk to us, and the literature's uh, on the back uh, in the mall on the book table uh, there. Thank you.